Hi, and welcome to Yeshiva Shem Ever. I'm Rabbi David Katz. This is Parshas Pinchas, entitled Finding the Gear Above Nature. Questions, comments, or feedback, I can be reached at Rabbi Katz at virtualyeshiva.com. Uh, just a quick note, what we're doing, uh, this was mentioned to me, you know who you are, uh, but it needs to be said. The, the way the class goes is the article is written on Friday. Over Shabbat, I go into the Haftorah and the Zohar on the Parsha, and I try to isolate the gear in the Parsha, as that's pretty obvious now. And I find that that, I mean, every time, actually, every time the isolation of the gear concept in the Parsha is generally what the Haftorah is talking about. That seems to be the common bond. And then once you go from the Haftorah and plug that equation into the Zohar, you, you really get the, what's called the Mochen of the Parsha, what the Parsha really is on about, why things are mentioned that, that are, are re seemingly disparate parts, and then they all come together when in proper context with the gear. So as I'm, I'm going to start now, as I always do, with the Haftorah and the Zohar, but let it be known, just like when you go to a restaurant and get a meal, right? The, there's an appetizer and there's the, the main course, and they have nothing to do with each other, right? You, you, you get the jalapeno dip, and uh, you want that for the whole meal because it's good, but game over. You know, the, the appetizer generally doesn't go into the entree. Uh, same here. Uh, the Aftora insights and the Zohar insights are interesting, and that's generally all it is. is uh, it's interesting. It paints a picture of where we're going. And when, the, when we start with the actual article explanation, uh, keep in mind the, the introduction work really has nothing to do uh, with the article. And that's mainly because when I wrote the article, I had no idea what I was going to be finding in the Haftorah and the Zohar. Uh, it's just kind of like a, a later clarification. So uh, keep in mind, as we do the appetizer, uh, the entree is a separate dish. <laughs> Part of the, the borrowed language, but that's what it is. So here we go. In the Haftorah, we have Elijah running for his, for his life away from Jezebel. Now, something very interesting happened as I was researching this. I mean, it's obvious why that was this was brought. The famous axiom in Torah literature, Pinchas Zehu Eliyahu. Pinchas is Elijah. So, what, what are we going to run into if not Elijah? With that said... And the article, based on, for, as we've read it, the love of Pinchas for Jethro. And when you go into the Arizal's Shar Gogulim, the Book of Reincarnations, you'll find that Pinchas is actually not only a blood relative of Jethro, but a reincarnation as well. And as I was reading... The, the Arizal's commentary on Pinchas and Jethro. It comes out that once, once Eliyahu makes it to, to Shemayim, to heaven, right, by the fiery chariot in the time that he's with Elisha, the Arizal says that at that time, when Elijah comes and returns and speaks over the generation's Torah, he's doing it from the soul root where he has a spark of Benjamin and the original soul spark of Jethro. And one interesting link between the two is that Benjamin is one of the four men in history who never sinned. Meanwhile, Jethro is the soul spark of Pinchas that causes Pinchas to sin. So you have quite a contrast. You have the severe and the, and the not severe. And what I realize is this is the concept, Giloy Eliyahu. 
the revelation of Elijah. It says that when the Torah is revealed on the secretive level, on any on any level of the secret, a major catalyst of revelation is when somebody has what's called Gilo Yeliyahu, the revelation of Elijah. And the, the, the books talk about all the different types of revelation of Elijah. You can have an actual manifestation. You can have a, a prophecy come to your head. You can fast for, uh, I think, like 80 days, whatever it is, and, and, and generate a revelation. But what I realized is that the Torah of the Tanakh that mentions Elijah, that itself is a revelation of Elijah. That itself. And he's running from Jezebel because of the sin of Jethro that he had in him. That when he sinned and he lost the divine presence, the Shekhinah, he, he thought he wanted to die because he lost all the parts of his soul. That was part of Jethro. What you have then is the story of, of Elijah running away naked in soul but it's on the level of revelation. We're seeing what Elijah himself didn't see. We have that perspective because the book was written. So you know, Elijah is saying, you know, Hashem, just kill me. And we can, if you look with, with affinity into the verses, you can see that Hashem really loves Elijah. And he says, I stood for you and I was for you. And Hashem really loves the guy. I don't know if Elijah even saw it himself. And here you have in the verses about Elijah, but it's the level of the revelation of Elijah. And once you have a revelation of Elijah, that's even greater than Elijah himself. Because the revelation speaks about Jethro and Benjamin being in the soul of Elijah, yet the verses themselves were devoid of Benjamin or of Jethro. So the character in the real time is missing Jethro. He may perceive Hashem as a thundering God. We have the liberty and luxury to view it as a revelation of Elijah. We have Jethro plugged in. Thus, from our perspective, we make a Gilgal. We make a reincarnation. We are putting Jethro into Elijah. It's not us. It's the Torah. It's the prophet that wrote the book. And when you read it like this, you basically have the ability to affect time. As we're going to see with the broken Vav and the covenant of peace with Pinchas. The broken Vav is, is, as, is as if to say, and Rav Ginsburg brings this down, the Vav in the beginning of a word, or in a word, has the ability to transcend time. And we're forced to look at Elijah as a revelation of Elijah. And Jethro is the consummate gear. So why does Hashem love Jethro so much? Hashem is obligated to. Because he loves the ger. In fact, Hashem makes it very clear that Hashem loves the ger, and if you don't love the ger, you don't love God. It's, it's, it is it perhaps the most stringent observance of the entire Torah. God says, if you don't love the ger, you don't love me. So here we have the revelation of Elijah. And by nature, it's Jethro. Hashem is obligated to love him. Now, at the time, or in the real time, Jethro wasn't there. When it's written, it becomes the revelation. You're infusing into the name Elijah, Jethro. And Pin Pinchas Eliyahu exists all through time. He was made angelic. Once you have Jethro, you're plugging in Benjamin. You're making a, a union. And remember that the Vav of Elijah was taken by Jacob. 
And it's returned to Elijah. How do you give back Elijah the Vav? Jethro's name was Jether. And only after becoming a Ger, he got the Vav to become Jethro. If Pinchas is to become a Ger, and Pinchas is Elijah, Pinchas comes from Jethro. He must return to the level of the Ger. As King David said, I am a Ger. And there's a secret that brought down by Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, that the name Pinchas actually contains the name Yudke Vavke, just like Eliyahu's name does when you have the hay of the prophet, Hanavi. Pinchas is the chief cornerstone that was rejected, making Pinchas Pina, Rosh Pina, the cornerstone. And every other letter then spells Yud and He. And the Vav between the Chet and the Samach is returned to Pinchas, making Pinchus, as in Chus Verachem, have mercy. And then the He making Hakohen the priest. And the broken Vav in the covenant of peace is telling you reinstill the Vav on every cellular level to Pinchas Eliyahu. Pinchus Eliyahu from Yaakov, Jethro instilled for the very sake and intention of loving the gear. Then you draw love from God onto Jethro. Elijah, Pinchas. You make a revelation of Elijah in the world. And that's what's needed to bring Mashiach. And who's Mashiach, says the Arizo? Pinchas. For the very act that he committed last week and this week. The revelation of Elijah made possible by Jethro. To accentuate and express God's love of the gear. The more love of the gear goes around, the more, the more causing we do of the revelation of Elijah. And remember, Elijah is not bound by place or time or by name or by deed. Elijah theoretically can go viral. That's the nature of an, of an angel. And he lives forever. And the target of Yonah says he was made into an angel. That's the revelation of Elijah that will announce the coming of Mashiach. An arousal in the world as if to love the gear. Making the, the whole world come to the revelation. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Or as it said, that which is hateful to you, to another do not do. The Zohar continues and talks about the level of righteousness. Where Pinchas comes from. Pinchas's name was given by his father Eleazar. Jethro was the father-in-law of Eleazar working on the council in, of the Pharaoh's court in Egypt. Shem, i.e. Eov, Job, was also in that council. And all names are brought down by Shem. Shem was taken to be the minister of God above to bring an atonement on the world. Because the world fell heavily, heavily into sin. Noah did it for a while as, as the primordial Eov code and died when the job was done as a tzaddik. Shem had to continue to bring the atonement and he's still bringing atonement to this day. And while Shem is engaging in names, that every name is brought down 
from Shem as Shem's vehicle to learn the Torah, which is a book of names. Abraham comes onto the scene as he is instilled with the Ger Toshav rule by Shem before Shem goes to his higher post to be a priest to God above. The famous system, it says, who's a greater tzaddik, Abraham or Noah? They say, well, Noah would have been a righteous person also in Abraham's time. What that means is that Noah would have actually achieved the atonement. But he never got the chance because he was bit by the lion. And Shem had to go to the Garden of Eden, eat from the Tree of Life. And he therefore, he relieved Noah of his duty. It's a theoretical question. The other answer is he wouldn't have been anything in Abraham's generation. Meaning he would not have finished the job of atonement in Abraham's generation. He would have been hidden. Whereas the idea is that Abraham was not hidden. The real question then was Noah to be greater than Shem or not? Abraham was revealed as a righteous soul because he was not bringing atonement for the generation. That was not his job. It's called Sadiq Viralo and Sadiq Vitovo, a righteous who suffers or doesn't suffer. He partially suffered, not like Shem. Shem suffered to the point he was left out of the Torah practically. The question is, if Noah would have been in that generation doing as such, as by not being maimed by the lion, would there be even be a Noah? That's the question. That This is derived from the job of Shem of bringing down names. That's how he does the atonement. Shem's job is to be the righteous on high. The names coming down for the, the secret of fruitful and multiply. Why is the first command of the Torah to, to produce people? That's how Shem is done bringing atonement to the world. Eventually the name of the Messiah comes down. And that was given by Elazar going to the relative Shem in, in the, the level of revelation of Elijah. The ability to ascend and descend. And the name Pinchas was brought down. The name Pinchas is what causes Pinchas to act and achieve what he achieved. Meaning the, 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 the best piece of Shem's work was naming Pinchas. Through the agency of Elazar, whose name represents the name of God Kael and causing seed. Or Ezer, a helper, same letters. And what do we call Shem? A priest to God, then Kael, a priest to God above. As I was learning this, they talked about Moses and the hitting of the rock. He hit the rock twice. Everyone knows, well not, I mean, it should be known, when you're righteous in the Torah and your name is stated twice, that means you inherit the world to come. If you look in the Exodus, Hashem tells Moses repeatedly, speak to Paro. Notice the word to, T-O, speak to Paro. Categorized by the Hebrew El. When not the name of God, it means to. And if you look in the Hebrew, Moses never achieves talking to, to Pharaoh. He stood before Pharaoh. There'll be a Lamed there, like to Pharaoh, but not the proper Aleph Lamed. As I was reading the Arizo, intertwined with all this, says the name causes. We know that the meaning of the name, Shemagarim, the name causes. But the name literally causes that Shem has the ability to plug in souls by naming. So if you were to name your kid a proper name, you actually have the ability to put any soul you want in your kid. If you can understand the names. That's the greatness of Shem and the ability to name. He knows all the names, all the characters. He's holding all the parts. 
So when Pinchas is named, Shem has the ability to make it latent with Jethro, Joseph, the ability to get to Elijah. And when you speak to a person, you're, called, you're addressing them by name. As God himself says, I've known you by name. Moses is being told, speak to the rock. Now if Moses speaks to the rock successfully, it will be written in stone. And Moses spoke to the rock. This whole idea of Moses not speaking to people would never have existed. It would have been the sanctification of God's name. As Shem himself was a priest to God above. If Moses speaks to the rock, all is fine and dandy. What does he say? Shall we draw water from the rock? Hamin Hasela. Notice the word from, Hamin, spells the word Haman. Just like the, the, the accuser on the, on the Purim spiel. The evil Haman. What's the message? If Moses speaks to the rock, the rock has the right to have a name as well. It might be generic, but it's general. The rock. Why do you have to have judgment on a rock? God himself is, has mercy on all creations, even a rock. Moses hits it twice as if to say, no name. You have no name. Not in this world or the next. But he was told, speak to the rock. The rock has within it water. By the creation of God. If Moses speaks, he brings out God's creation. Does it make a difference if you hit it or speak to it? The, the, not regardless, the water has, the rock has water. But if Moses speaks to that rock, just even by name, rock, then it will go down in the Torah, Moses spoke even to a rock. All the more so to people. And he doesn't call anybody a moron. And the whole thing with, with Egypt doesn't go down. That's what's going to be the power of Pinchas. Love your neighbor by as yourself is impossible. But it says to love the gear as yourself. And the trick is that you cannot love anything like yourself. Nature won't allow. So if you speak generally to it, or love something generally, it's a courtship, then you can begin to love it, even on an individual level. The gear is a general term. Love the gear. Love what the gear stands for. That rock also stood for something. There's something to love. You don't need to love a rock. This is not America. You know, the next thing you know in the court system, you can marry a rock. Love it generally. The rock does, you know, it brought forth water. That's something to love. It's interesting. The gear represents the world of Bria, creation, spirituality, in the flesh. There's something to love. Now you can begin to work out that love. The water is like love that comes out. The gear speaks. And lo and behold, he speaks words of Torah that are compared to water. Now you can love the fellow man as yourself. You went beyond nature. That's what Pinchas did with his grandfather Jethro. Love the gear. Find the, the whole Torah bound up in love thy neighbor. Moses forgets the law. Pinchas remembers the law. 
And he is now charged with returning the law in the end of days. Pinchas might not have spoken to the rock. Pinchas did, however, love the gear. Pinchas did, however, love God. And Pinchas did bring back the love of God and the people, the entire congregation, Gerim and Jews. For that, Pinchas was rewarded. And it's all bound in the name Pinchas. He was given the covenant of peace. And for that, you have the righteousness that when, when everything is atoned for in the kingdom of Pinchas by Shem, all the souls are born, the Gerim come out to the love of the Ger. Pinchas takes his mantle as the restoration of the Torah in the end of days. You can see the thread through the Zohar, through the Torah, into the Parsha itself. The Torah was given at Sinai in Parsha's Jethro. There's no bigger apparent enemy to the people, to the Torah, than Jethro. That's how it could be perceived. Forget this gear business. You're going to Megayer, your family, and not interested. If you stick around Sinai, there is no golden calf. You abandon us, they'll say. Not needless to say, Jethro goes, gets his family into Torah. But if Jethro goes, then what about Pinchas? The very Messiah you, you await will be defenseless. Jethro makes a cheshbin a decision. Sanctifying God is more important than sanctifying Israel. The basis of all idolatry is to sanctify people. And Jethro's handed up the year with idolatry. The people are not so forgiving. They say, come on, just convert. Be Jewish. What do you have to do this gear stuff? They didn't understand. Pinchas understood. You have the Torah given with Jethro, and the messianic conclusion is this week with Pinchas. That if you work out the equation, the only way you can come to love is yourself, which is what Pinchas expressed. That was his expression, was to love the gear. His name co comes from the gear. Jethro on Pharaoh's court. Shem was a member. Just like Jacob brought Levi before Shem to be named, Eleazar the, takes a wife and the daughters of Putiel, and the name comes from there as well. By the time we get to Parshas Pinchas, the name of the person is ripe. Pinchas is ready to take the spear and be the Pinchas. And the revelation of sorts comes from Jethro. The giving of the Torah and the ultimate fulfilling of the entire Torah. If the Torah is not fulfilled, then you can say it's an unfulfillable document. I believe that's called religion comes out of that statement. You can say, well, Shem fulfilled the whole Torah, but that was before it was given through Moses. And Shem was paid accordingly. But as long as you say the Torah cannot be fulfilled, well, let's exchange it for a new covenant. That will never, ever be a claim. Not by Jethro and not by the Torah itself. Pinchas fulfills what is necessary. He shows that you can go outside of nature, go beyond yourself, sacrifice your, 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 your very being, and fulfill what the Torah asks of you, 
Love the gear. Love Hashem. Love your fellow man as yourself. The equivalent of the entire Torah. Pinchas is going to express that he has the love with Jethro. From Sinai onwards. And people are going to laugh. When they laugh at the time of the spearing of Zimri and Cosby, not only are they laughing, they're saying, this guy is the son of an idolater. Kill him. He took out the great Zimri and Cosby. Now Moses and Jethro have a relationship as well, being incarnations of Cain and Abel. Yet Moses whisks them off conveniently. You know, Jethro is giving counsel of how to have the Sanhedrin. Moses is not exactly interested. But when you have Jethro and Pinchas, this is his grandfather. When it says, you will be eyes for us, Pinchas takes it literally. To the point that the love that he has is so great, he has to defend Hashem's honor. There is no question. He loved God. This Parsha comes out in the summer months. We just had the 17th of Tammuz. The anniversary of the golden calf. We're going to have Tisha B'Av. And every year you hear the same rabbis. Mashiach is born on Tisha B'Av. The dry hot summer. Yet our job is to find Mashiach in these very ashes. And here it is before you every year. Parshas Pinchas. To find in these parshiot will bring out the, the revelation of Elijah. These parshiot represent the whole Torah. From the Paraduma in Chukis. The nature of evil in Korach. The spying in the land of Israel and Shlach. Moses, Pinchas' job is to restore the whole Torah. Moses gives the Torah. Jethro is the domain of which it's given. In Parshas Pinchas, we have the whole Torah. Love your neighbors yourself. You have to the Recha Kamocha. To which the Torah says, Zeklal Gadol B'Torah. This is the big major hub of Torah. When you read the end letters backwards, from left to right, Zeklal Gadol B'Torah, it actually spells Hillel's name. As Hillel was the one who spoke it first in a written form. That this is the Torah. When you look in the verses in, in 1919 in Vaikra, 1918, love the gear. And the very next verse says about for, forbidden fiber mixtures, kilayim. And before it, it says, don't hate, don't taunt. Loving and everything about loving is sandwiched with the gear. One of the Noahide laws and a different counting of the seven says that mixed fibers, kilayim, is forbidden for a gear. So here you have on the spot, sandwiched between gear references. And the commentators say, how are you supposed to love someone as yourself when it's impossible? So they say, you know, 
don't hate and don't be jealous. Just don't, you know, go against your your standard love. Don't don't want a million dollars for yourself and then for the gear say, well, he can have like twenty bucks. You know, if he wins the lottery, let him have twenty dollars, but let me have a million. That's forbidden. They see that's the best we can do. Don't don't diminish for somebody else their love. But isn't the job and the goal to out outright love? We say, no, we can't do it. What can we do? Yet we're commanded to love the game as ourselves. But there's that word to again. A preposition comes in the commandment with the gear. Because the, the gear you can love. Because he has a title. People don't have titles. But the gear is a title. He represents something. When you keep it generic. Once it's generic, you're courting each other. Then you can begin to get a little bit personal. Wow, the gear talks. Does he jump through a hoop too? You start to lose the animalistic beliefs. Wow, this guy is a human being. Why wouldn't I love him? Why don't people love the gear? Then you find out the gear knows more Torah than you do. It's built in the soul. So let's get to a soul level here. Ah, oh, now you're, you're, you're actually going to call that friendship. It actually goes beyond friendship, beyond relationships. The gear has something that we all have. It's called a name. So when you say we don't have we don't have titles, we, we do have titles. You, you just didn't look at it. You saw a person, 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 person. The Torah says, let me give you a hint. There's a person who's called a gear. It's kind of like a name. And the more you get into the gear, you'll realize A, we're all Garim. B, it's another euphemism for a name. So once you start getting into the name, speak to a rock. If you can speak to a rock, I guarantee you you can speak to a person if you go by their name. And they will give their Torah to you called water. And when people shut down and you don't address them by name, they're like a rock. They're just like a rock. It says that the, the souls that are in the Sambatian River are stones all week, all week long. And on Shabbos, they begin to flow water like, like a river. Shabbos is the time to speak through names. Then if you can bring that out into the regular world, you speak to people by their name. You'll find out love isn't that hard. But if you don't get into the guy's name, he's just person. At least the gear has a half a name, gear. Once you have a stepping stone to step on, a threshold of common ground, oh, hey, gear has a name? Nice to meet you. God may have given the Torah to the Jewish people, but he gave the gear a name. Jews don't even have names. They think they do. The gear has a name. Put Torah plus name equals finding out about a person. Compassion, love, then you'll find it's no longer about who's first or who has what. It's called back and forth. And, def the, and, and being an advocate and loyal to one another. That's what Pinchas did with God. You'll find that you are able to transcend nature at that point in time. The Ger actually is, are, they're called B'nai Navim, sons of prophets. The Torah is a book of prophecy. Put it together, you get divine information. If you look beyond your backyard a little bit, step out from the get there, the, the line of love your fellow man as yourself, as long as you're looking to fulfill it, you'll find a gear you will fulfill it. It is possible to love a man as yourself. 
Pinchas understood by, by the divine providence that comes from Shem, mind you, from Elazar and the naming of Pinchas, putting the, the soul of Jethro in Pinchas, Pinchas forges the, the, the relationship with Jethro. When it comes to fulfilling the whole Torah, you would think to solve this equation, you would have to work out amazing details. In the end, it was just that simple. Love the gear, you are a gear also. You are a gear in the land. God Himself loves the gear. That's the repair of Moses. It's the opening to every door. When you find love in the world, then you can get everything that's beyond nature can be opened. Then when you come down to all these levels, don't be jealous, don't hate, don't, don't be this, don't be that. We know that love is a great level. The fear of God is what tells you you have to love. First comes year of fear. Represented by Abraham. At the Temple Mount with Shem. Shem says, where there's fear, there's shalom, there's peace. Then the two come together to make Yerushalayim. The connection with God and out of it comes love to the point that Abraham and Shem from that moment, we're called Shem Oavi and Avraham Oavi. Shem and Abraham, my lovers. Shem himself had to find the gear in order to, to, to fulfill the entire Torah, which he is a part of, even to the point of redemption as the righteous priest. He invents the gear. He says, there must be a gear. Abraham comes. You are a gear. Gives over the priesthood, gives over the laws of, the, of all the Torah. Abraham is the flagship of the priesthood and the Torah. The messianic mission was given over to Abraham from Shem. That will culminate at the Torah being given at Sinai. That will culminate in full circle the other Kohen Sedek, the other righteous priest, Pinchas. Same priesthood given by Shem to Abraham, same Torah, same fulfillment, same title, same redemption. It comes down to the, the Torah of the brotherhood. Moses and Jethro, they were, they were close in the repair of Cain and Abel. What Pinchas was able to do was the light of the Mashiach, that of the Messiah, the Mashiach, which spelled backwards is the annihilation of my brother. Pinchas eradicates the annihilation of my brother. Totally the repair of Cain and Abel. Not sending off Jethro. Not destroying Israel in the plague caused by Zimri and Cosby. When it's all said and done, the hidden vav of the covenant of peace is given to Pinchas. This is the kingdom of the Messiah given by God himself to Pinchas. The rede redemption of the firstborn. Shem was, was Malki Tzedek, a Kohen, a priest, and a king. All firstborn in Torah are supposed to have the priesthood and the kingship. All the Sfarim, all the holy Kabbalistic books, Hasidic books, explain that Pinchas' covenant of peace was the revelation of Malchus, the kingdom of God. The Vav broken, the letter Vav is broken in, in the word Shalom, peace, 
is a hint, as we mentioned, of many parts of the redemption, but also of the kingdom itself. But the essence of that kingdom is to be the end of where the kingdom began with Abraham and Shem. Otherwise, how do you explain that Pinchas' priesthood is a bit different? He was not of the seed of Aaron. Aaron only had four sons that were grandfathered in. Pinchas earns his way in. The revelation is he earned his way in the same way Abraham did. The same way that David did from Shem. Dilem number 110. You shall be a priest forever by my word, Malkitzedek. Pinchas' name comes from Shem. Shem is a part of the Torah world from the time that Shem came onto the scene after the flood. He's been in atonement for since the beginning. When he stepped on the new land with Noah's father, and they put kindness and tzedakah, righteousness, onto the earth. Shem went up to serve God. Abraham remained. The mission started. Torah was given. And there must be that conclusion as the messianic light was given to Abraham from Shem. And we know that Shem stood for Shalom, for peace, as Abraham was the reverence or the awe, Yira. And the goal, as we said, is love. Pinchas had the awe. He received the Shalom. And we say that the awe came from his love. In Hebrew, you have to have phonetic sounding words. So I give him my covenant of peace, Briti Shalom. But it should be Briti Shel Shalom. The word of. There it is again. The, the revelation of Torah and the prepositions and the verbs speak to the rock, speak to Pharaoh. Of peace. But if you look at the word Shalom, it contains the word of in its very beginning. No need to reiterate. It's like when, when it says in, in Genesis. Until Shiloh comes in regards to the Messiah. Shiloh, Shin Yud Lamed He, is a conjugation of Shiloh Hashem, an offering to God. And sometimes Shiloh is spelled without the Yud, making it the Gematria Paraduma, Red Heifer, 335, Shin Lamed He. And here's the same Shin Lamed. In the word shalom, they have the word shell. Of peace is in the word itself. A double entendre in the word. As hinted by the broken vav. Saying, hey, there's something here. Break it in half. That's the, con that's the connotation of and. The letter vav, as we're talking about, the, the time and the souls, all the things we talked about, it also has a meaning of and or or. As an OR. We know that it has the ability to repair souls, as we said for Elijah in the beginning, in Jethro. Now, when we take the meaning to be or, you say shin, lamid, meaning the shell, the of, the peace, or maybe it's not a lamid, maybe it's a mem, making the word shem, my covenant of shem. The priesthood that was earned from the upper world and not the lower world. Shem's priesthood of the third temple above. Or you can even say the covenant of the name. That there's more involved in Pinchas when he becomes Pinchus. Yurki Vavke is in the name. Give him my covenant of my name. Yurki Vavke in the name. Relieve Shem of duty of bringing restitution on the generation and bring the righteous priest, Messiah figure, four craftsmen mentioned in the Talmud. When all the, all the souls come out of the body, Mashiach comes, says Chazal. That would be Garim, that would be Jews, that would be bringing names out. That would be the repair of Zerubbabel, of forbidden seed. As if Shem needs more work than say false alarm? Eventually, righteousness must be wrought onto the world.
All of this began with Shem and Abraham, Malki Tzedek and Avraham, with the light of the Messiah coming through, the gear in creation, the Torah was given then. The laws of the priesthood were given then. Abraham develops it until there's going to be a Sinai with Jethro. The ultimate goal is there should be a redemption. All these things have to matter. And it all matters wrapped up in the name Pinchas. The Kohen, the priesthood, where does it come from? Abraham and Shem, where does it come from? Messiah, where does it come from? Torah, where does it come from? Jethro, all these random things that we find all throughout the Torah. The knot that ties it together is Pinchas and his action and his name. Called the revelation of Elijah. Pinchas is Elijah. The Shem brought out the name Pinchas. It had in it all the secrets of that one would need to know. It goes back to the secrets of the red heifer. Abraham becomes the quintessential red heifer when he says, I am but dust and ashes. After having stood in the presence of Shem. The ashes and, 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 and dust of Abraham represent the repair of the golden calf in the red heifer. King Solomon wished to have gained in access to the red heifer. He met Shem at the Temple Mount, the same place, or at Sinai, sorry, where the Torah was given, where Jethro looms. The Zohar goes on to talk about the wisdom of the red heifer and how it stands for the entire Torah understanding. It represents Panim la Torah, a face to the Torah. It says that there are Shvim Panim la Torah, there are 70 faces to the Torah. The Zohar says, no. All 70, everything that has a 70, Shvim, is a face to the Torah. And the red heifer is a 70. As the word sowed or secret is the value 70, the red heifer is the face of the Torah. Imagine if the Torah has a cover, like any other book. We say, God wrote the word Torah on the cover. Are you joking me? God, God has no creativity, no imagination, on the cover of his book, he writes Torah. So on, whenever he creates a thing, he writes thing. Whereas Adam named every every animal in the garden. Shem names every, every person's soul. The Zohar says the title of the Torah is called Para Aduma. Red Heifer. But don't read it, Para Aduma. Read it, Priya Adama, the, the fruit of the earth. They call that a seed. So when you open up the Torah and you say, Bereshis bar lakim, in the beginning of God's creation, let there be light. The seed is, is shed, and inside the seed is light. Well, how do you, what do you do with that fertilized seed? You give it water the second day of creation. Then it becomes a flourishment the third day. Then it needs sunlight the fourth day. Then it's alive the fifth day. Then you can have man come from the earth the sixth day. And on Shabbos, the seventh day, all, all seven, the red heifer gets a name. The son of the seventh. The red heifer is the essence of seven. Seven days in purity. 7 Sphero times 10, 70, it is the 70. But if you don't like that definition, you can call it para aduma, the making of a red cow. We want the Messiah to come. Everyone says, okay, my organization is going to make the red heifer. 
Well, how? Where is it? The answer is the Torah itself is a book that's title is The Making of the Red Heifer. That if you learn the Torah, you keep the Torah, you do what the Torah says, if the Torah is kept, you have, you will produce in the world a red heifer. It will come through creation. You encourage creation to create by keeping the Torah. The base of Bereshis, every kosher letter base has a kosher letter pay around it. We say the tail of the bait of Bereshis points to the olive behind it. Put it together, the initial letter is para aduma red heifer. The answer is the red cow. How do you get the red cow? The making of a red cow. The making of the red heifer. Red is love. The red cow is love the cow. What if the, 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 the meaning of the command is simply to love the cow? We say, why does the Torah say not to steal? Because it's logical not to steal. They say, but everyone gets stuck on the reason of the red of the red heifer. Why? Why is there a red heifer? And the answer is in the in the, in the parsha it re, it returns the pure state of existence. There has to be the mitzvah if it is the title of the book. But when you keep the entire Torah, that is how you bring the red cow into existence, the tenth one brought by Mashiach, Pinchas. But the cow is generic. You don't love a cow. The cow represents the one commandment that we don't understand. Therefore, love it generically. Give the love on to the Torah and the commandments. Then you get into the name itself of the cow. The spelled out meaning is Ish Elef Lo Mes, a man of a thousand doesn't die when you spell the letters in full. That there's a makshava, there's a thought process to this seed. Priya Adama, the seed of the earth. There is a the brain is in the seed. This is the benchmark of the entire Torah. Every letter, every commandment, everything has a brain power in it, behind the action. King Solomon wanted to meditate on the red heifer. What does it mean? And what it means is understand to love God's commandments, even the ones we don't know how to fulfill. The more you begin to get into what the Torah is, you, you'll, be, you'll be speaking the words of the Torah. Everything can be spoken to, even Iraq. The static imagery is to say, if this is how God create, treats the commandments, all the more so you should have this level on to people. If you can love the commandment of the red cow, then you can get to the point where you love God's creation. The title of the book is beyond the book itself. The book starts with Bereshi, but with the tale of the bait hints into something more, the Aleph and the Pei. Intellect is a gear in this world. Something that, that does not belong in this world comes in. That's the commandment of the red heifer. The red heifer is saying there's something more. But we don't get into what's more. We don't look beyond the Torah, aliens and stuff, whatever it is. Other gods, idolatries. It's just called the world of the gear. The place where intellect comes from. The place where God gave the Torah. Keep it generic. King Solomon says, don't investigate where the mind can't go. So what do I call it? Call it gear. 
and begin to love it generically. Then you'll begin to love it by name. Until you begin to love all gear, and you'll realize what's beyond the Torah? God himself. Because God is not the Torah. He gives the Torah, but love God. And that's what Pinchas brought down for all of time. To find the gear in everything. That's the red heifer, what it stands for. Once you find that, you can love the gear, love the name of people, love people, relationship. Once you have love, you've defeated nature.